Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Our Ladies Khabaroni event. And if you're new here, feel free to look at all our other events online in the YouTube and look at our socials. Today, we have Dipsha Mingani, who's been so kind enough to demonstrate how to use Shiny for Python to make interactive dashboards and interesting web applications. And uh, Dipsha, I'll leave it to you. Awesome. I am going to just start sharing my screen so everything's working perfectly uh, and get started. So hi, um, Simi, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an absolute honor. Um, and today I am going to talk about Shiny for Python. A quick intro, um, I'm a data science manager at Microsoft and I moved from marketing um, into data science domain. So huge fan of career switching and always happy to talk about what that looks like for people. Um, I'm going to assume everyone's able to see my screen, but if not, please holler. So these are the slides that you see here, shiny for Python. Um, like I said, I'm a data science manager at Microsoft. However, recently I had a major, major career switch. Um, as of a, the biggest career transition of my life, as of a month ago, I became a parent to a cute little baby uh, girl. And that's my family that you see on the right side. Um, aside from my partner and my baby girl, I have this absolutely crazy dog um, who's named after a Jungle Book character, Mowgli. And she is super energetic, crazy towards strangers. And you will see the rest of the presentation that she is the inspiration for the dashboard that I'm going to talk about today. So let's dive into Shiny because I know that's what everyone's here for. And uh, Shiny, as Simi said, a lot of stuff in Posit has existed for R and you're starting to see Posit invest a lot in Python. So Shiny for R has existed over a decade now and now we're Pythoning. So it's been recently like a year ago been made available in Python. So very quick recap for those who are new to Shiny generally is Shiny is a framework for building interactive dashboards that allows you to change not only the front end, but add calculations in the back end that don't need to be pre-calculated. So you can just select filters, it goes in the back, calculates whatever is needed, and then presents it on the UI. That's basically the, the framework of Shiny that exists. And here's a link if you wanna go learn about specifically Shiny for Python, but hopefully from this presentation, you'll get some idea. So what are we going to build today? Um, and let me just show you that live here. So this is a dashboard. And the reason I decided to create this dashboard is because I have an absolutely crazy dog who jumps on people, who jumps on children. And so now that we have a kid, if we do want a second dog, I wanted to be sure that I understand the characteristics and really compare all the characteristics between dogs before I decide to get the next puppy. And so this dashboard allows me to just select some specific breed and then just to see, look at what the traits of that breed are. And if some trait is super important to me, like let's say good with young children, I can see all the dogs with that specific trait and how the other dogs perform for that specific trait as compared to let's say French Bulldog. And if I wanna see, let's say, um, a shedding level and I don't want the shedding level to be more than three I can just change these settings and say only show me the dogs with rating less than three and so this is what basically we're going to try to create today um, and we're going to start from scratch but we're going to slowly build it up um, so hopefully this would allow you also to make a different decision when you decide to get a pet or not get a pet so let's dive into it so some initial setup that I'm going to talk about, if you are, I work in VS Code when I'm using Python and R Studio when I'm using R. So today I'm gonna, you'll see me primarily work in VS Code. So some initial setup is there's a Shiny for Python extension in VS Code, which is a really cool extension that allows you to write the code and see the Shiny output side by side um, very quickly and be able to run your code right away, even at saving. And you'll see that in a second. Um, Usually, this is a best practice when you're working in any Python project, like you create a virtual environment for that particular project um, and then put packages that belong to that specific project uh, so that you're not conflicting packages among different projects. So create a virtual environment for this. I'm not going to go over this, but if people need, I'll link to how to do link on how to do that later. 
And then um, there are certain packages required for this particular dashboard. I'm gonna go over those packages, but if you just wanna quickly install all of the packages on your side, there is in the Git repo, a requirements.txt. So here you will see a requirements.txt file, and you can just do pip install minus r requirements.txt. Um, these are the packages that are listed in there, which is the versions that I used uh, while creating them. And so that will just install all the required packages simultaneously. Awesome. So now let's get started. I'm going to go over a very basic command, and I'm going to run this basic command even on VS Code so you actually get to see how to create your very first Shiny dashboard in Python. So this is, I think, my favorite command, Shiny create dash dash help. Um, and what that does is it just tells you that if you want to create a specific type of Shiny dashboard, there are certain templates that are already available right off the bat within the package that you can um, you can build right off the bat. So you've got Shiny, uh, you see here all these templates when you say Shiny create help, you've got basic app, dashboard app, multi-page app. So we're gonna look at what, how to use this command. And let me switch here to VS Code. So if you see shiny create dash dash help, and it might be a little slow because it's just waking up and hasn't had its coffee yet. So while that runs, let me show you what happens when you do create a shiny, uh, when you do create a shiny basic app. So once you see this minus T template and basic app, I'm going to run the command to actually create the basic app. And this is what the command to create a templated basic app looks like, which a basic app is just like a single page application that you can start putting stuff in. So let me see if that, all right, perfect. So that did run. So you see here now it says, okay, all these templates exist. I'm gonna create the uh, basic app right here. Shiny create minus T stands for template. And I'm gonna say basic hyphen app. So those are the types of apps I can create. Basic app or dashboard or multi-page. I'm gonna to try to create a basic app here. All right, so here, this is interesting. Um, it asks you, would you like to use Shiny Express? And I'm not gonna talk about this right now, but I will come towards Shiny Express later on. So I'm gonna skip this right now. Right now, I'm just gonna say, no, use core Shiny Express, enter the destination, and I enter the home directory. And you see here, the basic app folder got created with an app.py file. So I'm gonna just quickly copy two things in that folder so we can start actually editing that app. So let's go into the basic app. This, this is the application that got created by itself. I did not give any command. And when you run this application, you will see the output because I have the Shiny for Python extension, you will see the output right here super easily. So it's a very simple app. It's not gonna do a lot, but you do see here there's a title. There is a scroll bar that allows you to select a specific number. And once you, once you select that number, it just has this text output that takes this number as an input, creates the string that says n times two is whatever number you selected times two and provides that output back onto the screen, right? That's the basic functionality of this application. So we're gonna let's quickly go over the layers of how this application is built. So if I go here, the first thing is we're importing that we already installed the Shiny package. We're importing some things from the Shiny package to get started and build that basic application. So the next component is the app underscore UI component. That's basically everything that you see here with your eyes, the front end, that's your UI component. If you, if you come from Shiny for our background, this may be familiar to you. And if you come from Python background and haven't built a Shiny app, this just giving a very brief recap of what the UI part does. So the UI part says, okay, add a panel title that says, hello, Shiny. Create an input slider. And input underscore slider means it's an input that I'm going to ask the user to put. And so the input slider set has an ID that says small n, has a label of capital N here, and it goes from zero to 100 with a pre-selected pre -selected value of 20. 
Then the next part of the UI says, okay, get an out. The next part of the UI is an output. So we're going to start the word with output because it takes this input, creates this output, and throws it back to the UI. So there it says, okay, get the output called txt. Where do I, where do I get that output from? And that's where the server comes into play. So the server takes that value of n that the user selected, multiplies that by two, and then creates this text string, defines this text string that says n times two is whatever the user selected as an input times two. Once the text string has been created, um, it needs to render that text to be able to return it back to the UI. And it's now made available to the UI. And then you just run the app. I know this is, uh, if you're really new to Shiny, this might be a lot, but after looking at this command a few more times, you will get very familiar with it slowly. So this is what the code structure of a basic app looks like. But now we want to personalize it for our data set. We don't want to use that. That's not the app that we're going to try to create. So I'm going to go back here real quick, and I'm going to copy some absolute basic code here. I'm going to first delete all of this because that's not the UI I want, and that's not the output that I care about. So I'm just going to, we're going to create our own UI. So what I just copied here, you can ignore that, is really just I'm importing Pandas because I'm going to work with data frames. And Pandas is a great library for doing that in Python. Uh, the pathlib library, if you worked in R, think of it as like here package, which basically just allows you to carry uh, paths from one project uh, location to another. So then I'm just going to read the data file that I have. So my data file is dog underscore traits underscore CSV. It has breed, specific trait, and the rating associated with that trait. So once I've copied that, let's actually start creating the UI components. So I want, first of all, I want a UI output that's like just data frame in my Shiny app that just allows me to look at what my tabular structure is. So I'm going to say UI dot output, and I need a data frame output. So I'm going to say data frame. Um, I need to give it an ID that says, okay, go get the dog underscore DF data frame from the server. So now I gave this ID, but on the server, that doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to just say, hey, um, the UI needs me to render a data frame. And then I'm going to define what that data frame name is. So that data frame name is going to be define dog underscore DF. Oops dog underscore df. And in Python, whenever you use define, you're basically defining a function and sending it back to the UI. So this is a function. That's why we're going to add a round bracket against it. And then let's define what the data frame is. So here, I'm just going to say the data frame is df, which is this. So I'm just going to return the data frame as it is. This is a, this is a simple server command, but I wanted to wanted you to just take a look at what that structure is when you start building it yourself. All right, so it's running. It's It has run. This is my Shiny app basically right now. Doesn't look pretty, but it has a tabular output that says, hey, this is my table, read, trait, and rating. Now, that's not all that I want to do. I want to also add a plot to this Shiny dashboard that says, hey, can I have a plot that just tells me for a one specific breed, show me all the traits only for my selected breed, show me all the traits and their rating so that I can just compare there. So let's add another UI element. And this time, instead of data frame, we're going to look for a plot. The UI is asking, hey, server, give me an output of plot. And that plot, let's say I'm going to call it breeds. Yeah, one second. Yeah. I'm going to call that breed plot. Now, notice that there's a comma here. I keep forgetting. So if you see an error come across later, feel free to remind me, have you added the comma? So there's a breed plot. We haven't defined that on the server side yet. So let's go ahead and define that. Now, instead of rendering a data frame like we did earlier, we're going to render a plot. And then let's define that plot. Define read underscore plot. And because it's a function, we're going to give it a round bracket. And I'm not going to create an, an entire plot. I just have this function called uh, inside this trait rating plots 
uh, .py file that just takes the input of a data frame and the breed that you want and just plots it. I'm not going to go over that plot code, but you have it available here if you want. So I'm just going to call, oh, I cannot call that plot just yet because I haven't imported that function yet. So I'm going to import that function from trait rating plot. Let's import, I think it's called, yeah, create trait rating plot. So now it's grayed out, but I haven't called it yet. So let's go ahead and call it here. Create rate, let's give it the input of data frame. And let's say I want this to be plotted for bulldogs first. And then let's return the figure that we just created. So now what this is going to do is it creates that figure plot and whatever it returns get defined gets defined under breed underscore plot and then gets shown into the UI. Let's see. So there. Something's happening. Connection open means it's done. Um, so this, you see the plot here as well. And you see here that it's for bulldogs. Now, if I wanted this plot for, let's say, a French bulldog, I would have to go ask the user to change the code and instead of bulldogs, give it a French bulldog, which um, doesn't make sense because we're creating a dashboard and we're going to give the ability to the user to add that filter. So I'm going to quickly here add a filter and show you how to create that filter. So let's say this time it's not an output. I'm asking the user to input a read name. So I'm going to ask for an input. And I'm going to say input underscore select, which means I'm going to give it a list of breeds to select from. Um, I haven't yet created the list of breeds. So let's go ahead and create the list of breeds. So breeds equal to DF, which is my data frame, dot breed, dot get me the unique uh, breeds that are in that data frame and convert that to a list so I can use it in this select command. So once I have the UI input select, the first thing I need to give everything output input is an ID. So I'm going to call this input breed that the user inputted. The next thing in, in it, I need to give it a label that says, OK, what should the user see above that select filter, which is, hey, select a breed. So kind of an instruction. Now, in that select drop down, I also need to tell it what list should you select. So we're now going to give it choices. And I'm going to say, go pick up the breeds that I just created. And then maybe the first selected value, just put it at as bulldogs. All right. So, oh, invalid. I think I jinxed myself, so I forgot that comma. So let's try that again. Great. All right, so you see here a select breed got added here. Um, so let's say right now I the default is bulldogs. Let me select French bulldogs. Um, but looks like this is not changing because we haven't done anything on the server side to use that select filter that the user inputted. So if you see the select filter, I gave it an ID input breed. Now the way you access that on the server side is by calling the input command. So instead of bulldogs here. I need to access the input that the user gave. So I'm just going to call it input dot. That's how the any kind of input starts on the server side. And then I'm just going to give it the idea of which input am I looking for. So input breed that the user gave. And when you're any kind of um, input from the UI is passed to the server as a reactive value. So we follow that up with um, closed curly bracket, oh, sorry, closed round brackets. And so now this should hopefully update when I select something else. All right, so French Bulldogs looks like it got updated for French Bulldogs. And now we have the block for French Bulldog. So now I'm going to move back to the presentation uh, to make a lot other changes in this dashboard, because this is clearly not a pretty dashboard. This is, frankly, does not look like a dashboard, it just looks like something's thrown around. So let's make add some more things. Let's make it prettier. And I'm going to move to the uh, presentation now that you know the basic structure of how it's created. Perfect. So personalizing the app, we already went through a few things. So I'm not going to repeat that. This was how to add the table. This was on how to add the plot. And notice that each of my slides is going to have a heading 2.2, 2.1, 3.1, etc. Each of these headings has a code file in my repository so that you don't have to worry about other 
code files. If you just want to see how this is created, you can just go to that code file or just copy the code from here and be able to run it isolated. You're, it's not dependent on other slides. It's not dependent on the code in the other slides. You can run it standalone. Now, um, I talked about filter, but you don't want to just throw the filter up in the main part of the dashboard. You want to um, create a pretty like sidebar layout like you see here. Let's see, yeah, it's still available. So you want to create this sidebar layout where all this, everything sits. And this is the main panel and this is your sidebar. So let's see how we do that. So I'm in all of these slides, I'm going to show you the whole code, but you don't have to look at the whole code. I will always highlight what I'm adding on top of the previous code. So we're gonna forget about the previous code. We're just gonna focus on what new thing we added. So we're gonna add a sidebar layout to the thing that we just created in VS Code. So if you remember, we had created this breeds list so that we could create a select filter, right? Now the select filter, instead of just throwing the select filter, data frame output and tabular uh, and the plot output all one under another, we're gonna put it all in this ui.page underscore sidebar layout. And what that allows us to do is in that makes the entire page to be a sidebar layout page. And within that, we tell it, this is what I want in the sidebar. So I create another function called ui.sidebar and I just take, I just put my filter that I'd created, the select filter that I'd created, I just put that inside the sidebar. Now, the way this command works is, and this is slightly different from even within Python, how it used to be. And if you come from R, you are used to giving a side panel and a main panel. But in this, the way it works is anything that's not in the sidebar is and is there in the function, is it, it's just assumed to be in the main panel. So if you put this select command in the side panel, side sidebar, everything else, which is a data frame out, output and the plot output are considered to be put in the main panel. So it's just going to go ahead and do that. And so this is what once, to, if you run just this code, this is what your application would look like. Sidebar, table, plot. Now let's see. All right, sidebar, main panel. And then uh, render plot is just showing, okay, you need to add that filter that you added into the render plot by calling the input breed. We just covered that. So just getting familiar with that again. All right, now another type of filter that I wanna cover is selectize filter. It's one of my favorite filters because it allows you to type and get to the thing that you want. So for example, here, um, let's say if I just type in, start typing good, it would just come bring up the um, options that I have with that command. So that's why I like the selectize filter and I wanna be able to select multiple things uh, versus just one thing. So I'm gonna show you how to add a selectize filter. It's exactly the same as the select filter, but the only difference is my select filter for the breed was updating the plot. This time for the selectize filter, I want it to update this data frame, which means that if I select the traits, I want to see all the dogs associated with that trait. So the traits that are important to me, I can compare all dogs against that trait. That, that's my goal. So let's add that. So first I'm going to create the list of unique traits that I have available in the data frame, similar to how I created the list of breeds. And I'm going to then create a selectize filter. Um, which is exactly the same. You're not gonna change anything. It's, the values are exactly the same as select. The only difference is you can give an option called multiple here, which allows the user to be able to select multiple things. You can make it false if you'd rather the user select only a single thing. Perfect. So once you have created that filter, make sure you go back to your server and actually filter the data frame on the server side this like under the dog DF data frame, you go filter your data frame on the selected input train and then return that data frame back to the UI. Perfect. Now I'm gonna try to add one more um, type of input. And the reason I'm at showing this slider is because it'll impact the server side slightly differently. And I'll show you how. I wanna add here two slider inputs. So if you remember select breed only updated this plot, the select ties of traits only updated this data frame. 
Now I want to create a minimum rating and a maximum rating scroll bars that don't just impact one of them, but they impact both of them. So in both of them, let's say I don't want to see any rating that's above, let's say, three rating. So this is what I'm going to show you right now on how to impact multiple things on the server side simultaneously. So first, let's quickly create the slider inputs. And because it's an in input, you start with ui.input. And when you start underscore, all the options come up for you as an input. And we're going to select the slider input. Like everything, outputs and inputs, it, the first thing it needs is an ID. So I'm going to give this the ID rating minimum, this the ID rating maximum. I'm going to give it the label that you see the words written here. That's the label. I'm going to say minimum, maximum, and the pre-selected value. Now, this part is simple. We, just like any other filter, we created these two filters. Now I'm going to show you how to update the server, multiple outputs on the server side. So this is where reactive calculations come into play. And to use reactive calculations, earlier we were only importing app, render, and UI from Shiny. We now need to import something called as reactive as well from Shiny. And what does reactive allow you to do? So instead of the render data frame and the render plot we created, we're going to create a reactive calculation. A reactive calculation, let's define it as like my filtered ratings. Filtered ratings is basically like my date takes my data frame, filters it on this these two values that says, okay, have my minimum rating above one, all the ratings should be above one, and they should be below three. So once that's been filtered, it returns that filtered rating plot. Now, it doesn't return it anywhere because we didn't ask anywhere in the UI that we want this data frame output. But the rest of the server components are now able to use this filtered data frame. And how do, how do they use it? So if you remember earlier, we had this DF, we were creating a data frame out of the DF, original data frame. Now, instead of the original data frame, we're going to use the filtered ratings data frame that we just created Salim. or Salim. yeah Salim go ahead oh no um so now we're going to use the filtered ratings reactive calculation anytime you use a reactive calculation as I pointed uh, earlier always you have to use a round bracket so when we were saying df we didn't have to put the round bracket because it wasn't a reactive calculation. Now that it is reactive, we're going to use it in the round bracket. And that's it. Once you do this, it's going to impact. Oh, right. oh yeah, that's where we are. So here, once you use this, um, it's going to now, let's say I do this. If I apply settings, it changes on both the plot and the tabular output. Now, the last thing I want to uh, discusses action buttons. What are action buttons? Um, they are basically an ability to create a button and have something acted within the server side or the UI side once that button has been clicked. One of those types of buttons is this apply. So I want the user to like select whatever they want, add whatever traits they have, and then change whatever thing they need in the ratings, and then click on apply versus anytime slight ch anything changes, it just starts updating the plots randomly. So we're going to add an apply button. And this is, again, this is an input button because we're asking the user to input and apply. So we're going to start with ui.input. And because it's a type of an action button, and I'm going to give it give it an ID of apply, and I'm going to give it a label for apply settings. And don't worry about the class. Button secondary just basically is the color of the button. So not, not that important. If you don't select this, by default, it has a button primary. So um, once I've created this apply button, by itself, it won't do anything. Now I need to go to the server side and tell it that, hey, only update these two things once someone clicks on the apply button. So let's do that. In the render data frame, we had defined the dog underscore, or dog underscore DF data frame, which is this data frame. Between those two, I'm going to tell it that, hey, we're going to make this, we're going to turn this data frame into a reactive data frame, which means, or a reactive event, which means only update this data frame if something, an event happens, and you can react to that. What's the event? The event is user clicking on input.apply. This apply is basically the ID 
that we gave to that apply action button. And then we do the same thing for the plot as well. We turn the plot also into a reactive event that reacts only when the apply button is clicked. And now nothing on the UI side will update unless apply is clicked. You can keep playing with the filter, nothing's gonna change. Perfect. Um, now it still does not look pretty. If you can see, uh, this is still what my application looks like. I've got the table underneath that, I've got the plot. The filters on the sidebar, it's not the prettiest still. So now let's start arranging stuff around, which is um, what Shiny gives a lot of flexibility for. So columns and UI.card layouts, we're gonna talk about those. There are many other layouts. I'm just started trying to get you familiar with some so that you can play around with all um, offline. So let's first thing I wanna do is add some space and boxes around my table and my plot just to make it look cleaner and maybe give this small heading that says select the traits to update this plot, select the braid to update this plot. So some sort of an instruction. Um, you can give any other title. This is the title I chose to give these two. So here I'm gonna introduce you to ui.card. Um, so if you remember, this was my tabular data frame output on the UI side. Um, and by the way, from here on out, I'm only mostly going to work within the UI. We're not gonna touch the server because now we're playing around with the layout of the UI. So if you remember on the UI side, I had said, hey, this is where you place my data frame output called doc underscore df. Now, instead of giving that directly, we're just gonna put it in this ui.card function. And that automatically puts it in this beautiful box. It makes it look much cleaner, I think. Um, and you do that with both of them. You do that with the table, you do that with the plot. And the and you can also use ui.card header function within ui.card to say, hey, what should the header be for this card? So now that you've added the UI, and now that you've put that into a small, like cleaner box, the next thing we wanna do is the column layout. I don't want them to be one on top of another. I think that's wasting of space. So here I'm gonna show you, oops. I'm gonna show you how you can just place them side by side. And this is a columnar layout. There's a few ways to add columns. I'm not gonna to touch all of them extensively, but this is, I think, a very clean way to add the columns. So if you remember, we had two cards. The first UI.card had the table in it. The other UI.card had the plot in it. Now, instead of putting that directly in my UI area, I'm going to encompass all of that into a function called ui.layout underscore columns, which just says, hey, I for these two things that are inside my function, I need a layout for columns. Now, how big are those columns going to be? How much space does each one take? How much gap is there between? How much height of the column, et cetera? We're going to give that in a second. So once I put that in that function, I can say, um, the gap between the two, I can adjust that. I can also say the column widths that says five and seven. So usually your entire page, the width of a page is 12 units. And um, any section that you use within Shiny is also 12 units. So whenever you're dividing something across horizontally, the it can add up to up to 12 units. You don't have to use all of the 12 units, but it can add up to 12 units. So I'm saying, hey, for the first tabular output, use the five units. And for the second, use the set, use seven units. And what's the first, what's the second? It depends on what you have put first, what you put second within this UI underscore, a uh, layouts underscore column function. That's it. Now you have added it into a column. It already looks slightly cleaner than what we started with. Um, so let's see what next we can do. Um, now, usually our company have, companies have like nice images. I want to prettify the dashboard with. In this case, I wanted to use, um, so I miss telling you the source of this data set. This data set was available in Tidy Tuesday um, and was consolidated by KK from uh, American Kennel Club. So this image was there in that data source page. So I just wanted to put that image in this dashboard as well. Now, how do you do that? Um, we use something called as UI tags. Now, UI.tags has a lot of other options that you can do with it. Image is just one of them. So I'm gonna show you so you can use UI.tags for other things as well. So let's add the image. 
the first thing I want to do is I want to get the image URL. So this image URL, I just got it from right clicking the Tidy Tuesday page um, where this data set sits. And then I'm going to just above, I want to add my image above these two. So if this is where my code is for my table and my plot, above that, I'm going to put the code that I need for adding this image because I wanted it to be like the top of my dashboard. So I'm just going to introduce a row above my area. And this is actually the reason I use this is because I wanted to show you another way of dividing a row into multiple columns that is different than the previous layout columns. So the first thing I'm going to say is, hey, create a column that is six units wide, starting from the left side, that is six units wide. Inside that, create a UI.cart. So like create a box. And inside that box, we're going to add our image. So the UI dot tags dot image is what allows you to add an image anywhere. So in that UI dot tags dot image, the function we're going to give is what is the source URL of the image, the height and the width that we want for the image. So the height and the width usually says how much of the card should it populate. Um, and I usually want it to be covered 100%. So that's the height and width I gave. Um, that's it. So this is one of the functions of UI dot tags, and you can use it for other things. I'll show you one quick thing that you can use it for as well. So tag headings and markdown text. Um, this is what I wanted to do next. I've added the image. Now I wanted to add a quick description for what this dashboard is, what the title of the dashboard is, et cetera, and where did I get the data from? This is where for the heading, I'm gonna use tags. For the rest of the stuff that's written here, I'm gonna use markdown. And I'll show you how here. So if you remember, we already have this image right here. And I'd said that, hey, I have a row. The first six units should be the image. The first six units is a column with where we're going to add the image. Now, the next five units, I'm going to use for the text. What's inside that text? The first thing is ui.tags.h1. H1 is a heading one. You've got h2, h3, multiple things, and other types of font sizes as well. So here, I'm going to say, hey, create a heading with using ui.tags that says, who's the goodest doggy? And then underneath that, I'm going to add the markdown that says, hey, I, I like markdown because you can add links super easily. So it says, hey, Tidy Tuesday data set, courtesy of this person, and the link to that person's data set, and then sourced from the American Kennel Club. So you've added the markdown, you've added the heading, and I'm going to put that in just this the same row as the image. And I'm going to say, hey, for this, just use five units. So if you see here, I'm not using all 12 units. I use the first six units, then five units, and there's a one unit gap on the right side here. I just thought it made it look cleaner, but you can use the entire 12 units of space. Now, panels. I think this is uh, this is my favorite part. Let me see if I can like, yeah, show you what panels are here. Okay, so Panels is basically, if you see here, I had this in just like a white space. I want to add a pretty box around it um, and see what, like, look, that just makes it look cleaner. But not only that, I'll show you how to make that area draggable. So let's first create a panel. This, So if you remember, this was my heading. And under the heading, I had this markdown. Instead of just putting this directly within my entire UI function, I'm going to put that in a panel underscore well command, UI dot panel underscore well. Now, all that panel underscore well does is puts it in this gray box. Um, once I put it inside a well, I'm going to add one more layer. I also want to make this draggable. Like I can actually carry this and like drag it around. Um, so I'm going to create a another, put it inside another function called UI dot panel underscore absolute. In that function, I actually have ability to how, what is the width of this panel that I want, um, how much space to give on the right-hand side. So usually panel absolutes start from the right-hand side. Like that's the absolute location they start from. And when you say right-hand side 75 PX, it just means how much space you wanted to give before you start the rest of the panel. And the last thing is draggable equal to false, which means it stays there. You don't like move it around. But if you make draggable equal to true, 
you can move it around like that. Frankly, I thought this was a useless but very, very cool feature. So I wanted to show it anyway. I couldn't figure out what a fun use case for this would be. But if you figure it out, let me know on like reach out and let me know what I can use it for. But it was a really cool feature. So I just wanted to show you anyway. Now, the next thing, if you remember in my dashboard that I could do is hide my settings. Um, that just, again, makes the um, sidebar or any type, anything under this area look much more cleaner where you want to use something like this for. And this is also done with UI.panels. So let's see how that is done with UI.panels. Um, and that is something called as a conditional panel. What's the condition? That if I click on the set limits for ratings label, that click would open up my filters. If I unclick that, my filters would hide. So we're gonna create, if you remember, these were our two slider inputs, right? Um, these two, two slider inputs. Now I'm first going to create a checkbox. That's, that's this checkbox, which is going to impact these two filters. So the checkbox says, hey, I have an idea of show. That's what I'm gonna use it for, show, and just give it a label that says set limits for ratings. Once I have created that checkbox, I'm going to put both of these filters inside a panel called ui.panel underscore conditional, which means this panel is only going to show up if a certain condition is true. And here input.show, which is this specific ID, and I can access it, I can access any input that the user has given by starting it with input.id. And this is the condition, which is once true, would allow these to be shown. If not true, won't allow these to be shown. So this is this command right here. Perfect. Um, I know there's a lot of information, but we have a few, like very few last things left that I'm gonna cover very quickly. Theme. Now, this is still really not the color scheme or the font theme I want. It's still just not as pretty as I would have wanted the dashboard to look. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to change the color of the sidebar. So like I like this color and I wanted to change it to something slightly softer color. So I'm going to first, this is my entire sidebar, right? You have the multiple filters, select filter, select ice filter, the checkbox. Um, and the conditional panel with the slider inputs and the action button that says apply. So within the UI.sidebar, uh, and once you have put everything, all the filters, the last few parameters would tell it what you want the sidebar to look like. So here BG means background color. I've given it this soft uh, peach pink color. And then there's another thing called open. Uh, this command equal to open means that by default, when this shiny dashboard is refreshed, the sidebar should show up as open. You can close it, you can open it again. There are other labels that you can give it that says start it with closed, but if the user wants it, they can open it. Or a certain parameters that say, okay, it should be permanently open. Don't let the user uh, close it ever. So there's different things you can do with this parameter, but this open means that it just starts with open and you can close and open it as needed. The other thing I wanted to do is this is just the sidebar color. I wanted to change the theme of the entire page to a nicer looking theme. And there's a lot of, oops, repeat of the information. There's a lot of themes that I can choose from. And where do those themes come from? Um, there's a package called shiny swatch, and we're going to import a theme command from there. And where does shiny swatch get all its themes? It gets its themes from boot swatch. So you can actually look at this page, um, on boot swatch and look at all these themes like Cosmo theme, cyborg theme, flatly theme, lumen. And I really personally like the minty theme. Um, and so I'm going to select that and I'm going to show you how to create that theme. So if you remember, you had this first command called ui.page underscore fillable, which is just like, hey, that's the description of the entire page layout that you want. Underneath that, you just give it what theme that you want. So in this case, I'm going to create the theme.minty for the entire page. You can choose theme.cosmo or any other themes that you saw on that Bootswatch page. Now, this, now that we've done all of those things, 
this is what your final dashboard would look like. You've got a nicer theme, you've got the sidebar color change, your font is slightly different, your button, if you remember, this was a button secondary. And if you look at the theme, the secondary button is usually this color within the theme that I selected. So it updates the colors of the buttons and fonts, et cetera, as well. So that's how you change the theme of the dashboard. Now, this is it. We just created this app using Core Shiny. I want to touch Shiny Express really quickly after this, but I'm going to pause here to see if anyone had any questions. If not, I am going to continue for the sake of time to quickly cover Shiny Express as well. So if you don't know, or if you might have seen this announcement very, very recently, something called as Shiny Express was released. And I'm a fan already. It's a really cool thing. So I want to touch upon it. Um, and so to know what Shiny Express is, it's also important to understand the Shiny core structure. So everything that we went through today is actually Shiny Core. It's not Shiny Express. Um, and how did you create the core app? If you remember when we gave this command, Shiny create minus T basic app, it asked us whether I want to create an Express app or a core app. I went with core app. And the core app has this importing, a fixed UI element, everything, you all, everything that belongs to the UI is together, and then a fixed server element, server function, that has everything that belongs to the server side. The UI is all together, the server is all together, and that's how my application is structured, and then you call the app. And once you called this, this was the basic first app that was created by that command. Now, if you had instead gone with Shiny Express to create the same dashboard, this is what your compare comparison code would have looked like. So on the left-hand side, it's core. On the right-hand side, it's Shiny Express. So in Shiny Express, you don't have to say that, hey, this is my app.ui section, this is my server section. You just start putting things. So you, instead of within this function, you say, hey, first thing in my dashboard, throw in this title. Second thing in my dashboard, throw in this input slider. Now you don't have to ask for an output from the server side. You just throw in whatever code was there in the server side here. And once you have that code, it just knows that this has been created because it needs to be outputted, outputted to the UI. So it just does that. And so you don't have that like forced UI and server structure where all the elements need to be together. Why do we care about this? So folks coming from Streamlit and Python background usually was were used to this kind of a structure. And what, okay, so you've got quickly uh, what you import, your UI components and your server components, but they're not actually so separated out as UI and server. Um, and why is that important? Because if you want to create an app like this, let's say, so you've got a title, Hello Shiny, you've got a slider input, and you've got a server calculation that says, hey, n times 2, so 20 times 2 is 40. Then you have another UI component that says, hello again, Shiny. You have another UI slider input that says, hey, the this is Z. That's the label of this. Um, it only runs from 50 to 100. Default is 70. And tell me, Z times 3 is 210. So these two are UI components. This is a server component. So in Shiny Express, you can just do this. You have two UI components you have a server component that does the calculation and returns the string. And then you have another two UI components, the UI title, UI slider, and then another server component that returns the string. So really like you create as you go. And this is extremely amazing if you want to do a very quick POC using Shiny. So does that mean Shiny Core will go away? So why did we spend a whole hour understanding Shiny Core to begin with when Shiny Express exists now? Uh, and yeah, I had the same thought and I was like, shit, like I have learned all of this thing in Shiny for R. This is a format I'm used to. What's going to happen with that? So let's take harm. In the announcement for Shiny Express, it was said that Shiny Core is not going away anywhere because Shiny Express is actually built on Shiny Core. So everything that would usually they would have, have similar amount of improvements. The other thing the announcement said was, so when to use Shiny Express? 
when to use core. So the announcement said the Shiny Express is amazing for POCs. And I could not agree more because it really just goes as your, you want your dashboard to flow versus in a full structure. But Shiny Core is still the best ability, the best thing for larger and more complex applications. Now you've got this core app code, you've got this express app code. How do you switch from one code to another easily? Like, how do you learn that? So there, if you look at the Shiny documentation, the amazing thing is um, each documentation has like, let's say this is how you create a select filter, will have an express code, will have a core code. So you will always have both the codes available, whichever you want to use, and how do you want to switch from one to another, which is really cool. Um, they're they're going to continue adding more features here, and they're going to continue updating the documentation to make it clearer. Now, I know that was a lot of information. Um, I'm going to also take a sip of water here. Um, I'm sure you need that too. So don't worry. All the resources that I talked about, all the code that I showed, you're going to have that available as presentation. Note that every single slide, the code on every single slide, you can run it as silo by itself. So whatever you care about, just run it and see what you need from that code. Um, the actual code for this dashboard is also linked in this GitHub repo. Um, and the app that you can play is already deployed using Shiny Apps IO. Um, and I've kind of reached my limit with that. So um, this is the application if you want to just go play with the application itself. The other peeps I couldn't resist, like these are the peeps you have to absolutely follow. Uh, Gordon Shortwell creates amazing resources constantly for Shiny for Python and Shiny Express. Um, and basically all the announcements, um, he's on top of them. So follow him on LinkedIn uh, to stay up to date with what's happening with Shiny Python. And this is an upcoming Shiny Express webinar. So if you liked what you saw, like a peek into Shiny Express, there is a webinar, I think in the coming week by Winston Chang. So I have here linked to, the, to Rachel's post from Posit. Um, that says, how do you go sign up for the webinar? And then some documentation for deployment and the Shiny application right here. That's it. I know this was a lot of information. I couldn't keep an eye on the chat, but I'm hoping that this was easy to absorb. And um, if there's any more questions, please let me know. Simi? Yeah, Dipsha, that was very insightful. Thank you so much for that. Do we have any questions or comments, suggestions in the chat. And thank you to Livy and JD for manning the chat. <laughs> it was just a lot to, to handle. Do we have any questions? I do see here that, hey, someone's new to Python. So if it's any consolation, I am brand new to Python. I am like very, very new to Python. In fact, this Shiny app is probably the first time and as much coding as I've done uh, with Python. So this made it very, very easy. And this is where I think like chat GPT type things are really helpful because like when I was creating plot code and all, it was really quick to be like, hey, this code is not working. How do I create this code properly? So definitely new to Python, uh, but just think of it as a shiny application structure and Python uh, separate structure for like plotting Python, using data frame filtering, et cetera. So that's slightly different. But yes, I'm brand new to Python too, so I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions, any comments? I think I managed to put all the links that everyone shared in the chat in the Google Word, so you can head on there and take a look at it. If we don't have any other questions, is there anything else you guys would like to like talk about? If, no, like announce? Like you mentioned there was a... Um, a webinar happening soon. Was it about, was it, who is it from again? Shiny Express. I think it's by Shiny Winston Express. Chang. Um, okay. It's on Shiny Express and I've linked to the LinkedIn post that Rachel has. Oh, okay. Yes, in that, in the slides itself. Oh, all right. Mm. Any questions, comments? I don't think we have any. Mm. I think we've all, if you guys are, well, Dipsha, are they, is everyone free to reach out to you? LinkedIn, Mastodon, absolutely. can they DM yeah. you? Yes, absolutely. Just give me a reference where you're coming from so I know um, the context of what you've seen here. Uh, 
and please feel free to ask any questions and JD and Libby thank you so much I see like all the chat and you are uh, monitoring and answering questions there so thank you so much I feel like I need to save that chat for all the resources that even I don't yet have yes thank you guys I you don't have to worry about the recording that it will be uploaded in our YouTube channel and I will reach out to you and I'll set it out saying this is the link so if you want to go back and go through it again and you feel free to and Andrea Gomez welcome we we have Andrea she's part of the leadership team of Our Ladies Global so Andrea can you say hello to everyone if you can I hope it's the right person I just know Andrea is it you hi I'm here <laughs> sorry sorry I am not very well speaking English uh, okay. I'm from Colombia yeah, but I live in Buenos Aires, only Spanish, but it's an interesting theme. And thank you so much. I enjoy everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's oh, something no doesn't understand, but it's a good theme. I, I enjoy this, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Oh my gosh, it's a part of the leadership team. Yeah. Here. I'm so excited. <laughs> right, yeah. I think... Thanks. If that is all, I'm going to, okay, I'll just say yeah, thank you, everyone. Here. Um, yep. I had a question that was directly sent to me, which was, how do I save this chat? Um, I don't know if it's like in the recording chats are accessible or if that is something that would be available in the Google chat for resources. Um, so just wanted to ask. You can save Zoom chats um, at the bottom of the chat. There's the three little dots. Um, that says more. If you click that, you can hit save chat. You're amazing. Thank you. So grateful for you. Perfect. There it is. Um, so everyone can click the three dots and save the chat. Sorry. Go okay. ahead, Simi. Right. I was just going to say thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you. Oh, oh what am I doing? Oh, gosh. Well, all right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you next time.